Good afternoon. On behalf of the Art History Department at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, I would like to welcome you all to our third annual student conference, The Way Things Work, Art is Science, Science is Art. To those of you who traveled here today from outside of the university, welcome to our campus, and we hope you enjoy your time here. Thank you all for coming, and we hope that you will be both entertained and delighted by today's conference. This afternoon, we will be hearing from five undergraduate and graduate student speakers from UMass Dartmouth and New York University. These talented individuals present their thoughts and research on a range of topics concerning art, science, and technology. We will also hear from two UMass Dartmouth professors, Robert Fisher from Physics and Harvey Goldman from Digital Media, who will discuss a collaborative project between scientists and designers on campus. Finally, Dr. Kristen Swenson, an assistant professor of art history at UMass Lowell, will deliver the keynote lecture titled Critical Landscapes, Art in the Anthropocene. Before we begin today's festivities, I first wish to say a few words on behalf of my fellow classmates and professors in art history. As a graduating senior and having served as president of the Student Run Art History Club for the past three semesters, I feel as though I can fully attest to the wide range of talent in our midst, as well as to all that we have accomplished as a group. In the past three years since its establishment, the Art History Club has helped coordinate three annual student-run conferences at the culmination of each academic year. We have additionally organized various art-related lectures, film screenings, workshops, social events, and field trips to museums in Boston and New York. In organizing these events, we have collaborated with numerous other clubs and departments across campus, including figure drawing, painting, graphic design, religious studies, and physics. As president, my mission is to have the club function as a resource that students can use to enhance their academic, personal, and professional goals while sim simultaneously having fun and learning something new. This past academic year, the club has hosted many events. Professor Crystal Lubinsky, who teaches in UMass Dartmouth's Religious Studies program, graciously delivered two lectures on co topics concerning religious art throughout different time periods and cultures. In the fall, we invited local independent filmmaker Aaron Kadu for a roundtable discussion on film technique and production, in which he shared his recent experiences directing and producing the recent documentary, The Bridgewater Triangle. The premiere of this film likewise took place on the UMass Dartmouth campus in October and received a turnout of Barclays 600. In November, we invited MFA design student Ken Leo to present a lecture on his MFA thesis project titled Environmentally Responsive Graphic Design. Also in the fall, the Art History Club worked alongside painting students and faculty to organize the club's first two-day trip to New York City. On this trip, students and faculty visited galleries downtown, the Met and other museums along the Museum Mile, and a traveling Dutch painting exhibition at the Frick Collection. Just a couple of weeks ago, we hosted another campus-wide day trip to New York with stops at the Met and the MoMA. Earlier this semester, we invited two gallery co-workers from Providence to discuss the business side of operating a commercial art gallery. This event was both well-attended and well-received by members of the UMass Dartmouth community. Lastly, and perhaps most relevant to today's conference, at the beginning of this semester, the Art History Club coordinated two guided tours of the IDEO studio on campus, which opened in the fall 2013 semester. IDEO Studio, which stands for Innovation, Design, Engineering, and Art Studio, is a collaborative venture between the College of Engineering and the College of Visual and Performing Arts. This space contains state-of-the-art equipment for student and faculty use, including a 3D printer, a laser engraver, and a full-length green screen wall. IDEO Studio is intended to be a place where engineering and art students can come together to work on collaborative projects. Living up to its name, it is a place where new ideas are born. These numerous events and activities encapsulate only a small portion of what art history students have accomplished within a relatively short period of time. With respect to the faculty side of things, we are lucky to be taught by a group of dedicated and engaging scholars. Last month, Memory Holloway, our wonderful department chairperson, will receive the Faculty Outstanding Women Award for her contributions towards enhancing the lives of women both on and off campus. Professor Pamela Karimi was appointed the reviews editor of the International Journal of Islamic Architecture. Professor Thomas Stubblefield was recently awarded a research fellowship from the Center of Creative Photography at the University of Arizona, through which he will conduct a research project on German photographer Joseph Breidenbach. Professor Hallie Meredith, our newest department faculty member, will be teaching an innovative new course in the fall on the history of art making. 
Also for the third year in a row, Professor Anna Dempsey and Dawson Seidman co-taught the Art History Department's Senior Seminar Capstone course. In this course, upperclassmen art history majors and minors are given the opportunity to curate an exhibition at the CBPA Gallery. The theme of this year's show is the history and legacy of the Swain School of Design. This former private art college in New Bedford, which forged with UMass Dartmouth in 1988, was highly innovative for its time and helped set the stage for much of CBPA's curriculum today. Our show, which opens next Thursday, is loosely based on an article that Professor Anna Dempsey wrote for the Journal of Urban History. Approximately 30% of students who took this class in its first two years received job or internship offers as a direct result of the skills learned through their coursework. This percentage speaks for itself. Employers are impressed that students are able to develop extensive curatorial and research skills as undergraduates, which is not a common offering in their undergrad or history programs. Now, back to the conference. The idea for this year's theme arose from an increased interest in interdisciplinary studies on campus, specifically between the arts and the sciences. While many people regard these fields to be very much separate in their endeavors, with the arts as creative pursuits and the sciences as intellectual quarries, this notion is misguided. There is, in fact, a surprising amount of overlap and similarity between the two fields. This is seen as early as the 15th century with the innovation of linear perspective, continuing up through the 1960s with the onset of the environmental art movement, and extending into the digital age and the work of artists such as Char Davies and Heather Dewey Hagwork. These represent just a few examples out of hundreds, if not thousands, of unique amalgamations of art, science, and technology, exemplifying the ways in which these disciplines continue to inform one another. Art is a process of discovery, just as science is a process of creation. Therefore, art becomes science, and science becomes art. One cannot exist without the other. To view the full text of our call for papers, please refer to the conference for sure. These can be picked up by the main desk at the entrance. Before we begin, I would like to personally thank everyone who made today's conference possible. Specifically, the five other student organizers, Virginia Luongo, Betsy Janis, Trish Burke Smith, Adrian Mercer, and Rhea Bethel. Our faculty advisors, Pamela Karimi and Thomas Stubblefield. Graphic design student, Bing Lin, who has designed our conference posters and brochures for the past two years, in addition to all of the promotional posters for the Art History Club. All nine of today's presenters for being here today, especially Professors Fisher and Goldman, who kindly agreed to participate in the conference despite their busy schedules. And lastly, everyone else from UMass Dartmouth and beyond who helped out with the conference in some way. Each of your efforts have helped to make this event possible and your contributions do not go unrecognized. I would finally like to acknowledge CBPA Dean Adrian Teo for his continued support of the Art History Club and Department and Chancellor Davina Grossman for her interest in bringing the art and science together on campus. Without further ado, I would now like to invite our first panel moderator, Betsy Janis, and our first two student speakers to come forward. Infinitely reproducible and easily individualized. 
already available in public schools and libraries, it will be not too long before 3D printers and scanners are common household appliances. We will print out your newly purchased toys, accessories, and replacement parts for your dishwasher in ease, turning your wildest dreams into ordinary reality. Digital fabrication has revolutionized the design world allowing the inexpensive, rapid prototyping of products that would have taken months to produce not a few years ago. In tension with the effortless reproducibility of the digitally fabricated stands the traditional craft objects. One of a kind remain limited numbers. In this sense, art and craft have had trouble accepting 3D printing as a medium, since the ease of reproduction affects the value of an object. But Mitsuran addresses this problem by creating hybrid pieces of craft and digital design, investigating an entirely new making practice. In his first project, Hybrid Reassemblage, Zoran and Mia Buchli restore broken ceramic pieces with digitally printed nylon elements, accentuating the destruction of the ceramic while retaining the form of the original piece. These vessels explore the various layers of risk in Baltimore craft. In traditional craftsmanship, the object is subject to the judgment and care of the craftsperson. Working in an analog material, the object itself is the only record of the maker's effort. Digital craftspeople also make a series of subjective decisions that reflect their skills, perspectives, and values, but there's little risk beyond a computer crash as they have access to their history, save files, and edit histories. By smashing carefully crafted ceramic vessels, Zoran and Mutually explore how digital design and 3D printers can be used to produce unique artifacts. Since the shattered remains of the ceramic base are one of a kind and impossible to reproduce, reprinting the nylon elements would be useless, subverting one of the inherent qualities of 3D printing. Further exploring the craft potential of digital design, Amit Zoran's next project sought equality between digital practice and craft. Through hybrid basketry, Zoran explored the intertwining of 3D printed structures and reed. Basketry is a flexible and forgiving medium that easily adapts to new technology, inviting experimentation. In basket four, Zoran accepted the risk involved in handwork. Though the shape of the basket, potentially hard to achieve traditionally, is defined computationally the woven pattern is not. While weaving, Zoran was free to make design decisions about color, density, and pattern to create a unique object. Zoran says his baskets are a physical manifestation of an intensifying desire to develop a new way of thinking about these polarities. The machine as a generator of control and innovation and human manual skill as a preserver of artistic production and culture. My hope is to substantiate a new hybrid territory of investigation and discovery in which the value of artifacts produced both by machine and man can infuse our excitement about technological process with a need to remember the very soil from which it came. Amid Zoran's words resonated with me. Inspired, I joined this emerging group of hybrid craftspeople balancing analog millinery technology or techniques around interactive or digitally fabricated details, I produce a unique wearable experience embodying the virtual extension of self through social media. 25 years ago, Russell W. Bell posited, knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, we regard our possessions as part of ourselves. The extended self includes those persons, places, and things to which one feels attached, which become cues for others to form impressions about us and function as memory markers for ourselves. Traditionally, these possessions would include a music collection, letters, or pictures. But with the advent of social media, these have all taken on digital forms, publicly accessible through social media networks. One of the few forms of extended identity that continues to be purely physical is our clothing. Unique among clothes, hats are the only piece of clothing that you cannot see from your personal perspective while you are wearing them. A hat's aesthetic, then, is for the pleasure of others and for others to judge your identity. 
In this sense, a hat is emblematic of the position you hold to others. A policeman's hat indicates that he is here to protect us. A baseball cap shows that you are a fellow Red Sox fan. By combining digital identity with the physical extended identity of the wearer, I am indicating that they are essentially one and the same. Using three different types of manipulated wool, I created three hats, each including digital mediums, highlighting the various ways in which material and virtual extended self have merged in the digital age. Made entirely from wool, this hat, titled Nice to Meet You, is constructed using traditional millinery techniques of wet felting and steaming wool. A modern variation on a cloche hat form, the thick felted band contrasts with the thin blue hood. Exploiting a loophole in Facebook's URL, I designed and screen printed a QR code such that whoever scans it, it brings them to their own Facebook page. This hat creates a unique experience between the wearer and the viewer. Upon initial meeting, where one might form an impression based on clothing, the viewer scans the QR code, revealing a portion of their identity not initially visible. This non-digital hat seeks to reify the way we learn about each other in the digital world. Digital media also augments social relationships. My relationship with old friends is based entirely on wall posts, not letters. Photographs are never passed from hand to hand, but shared with everyone. These pictures and interactions online even gain a patina of age as friends comment on them. Browsing through the history on my eight-year-long Facebook wall causes severe bouts of nostalgia. <laughs> to represent this aspect of digital identity, my next hat, titled How Have You Been, consists of two needle-felted wool objects, which are held together by 3D printed bands. Needle felting wool creates solid but soft objects. The common form shapes nestle together to create a yin yang. When 3D scanning, markers have to be put all over the object in order to achieve an accurate rendering. I include the needle felted dots in the final piece as an indication of their digital identity. Using the 3D meshes of the needle felted forms, I created curved linear bands to hold the soft shapes snugly together. The physical wool objects are held together by a digitally designed object, expressive of the way in which digital media both bands one person to another and bands one person to their former self. In my next hat, What Do You Do? I followed more directly in a bit for Zoran's footsteps. I designed a basket hat structure, playful in shape, to be 3D printed. I then hand spun wool yarn on a drop spindle, one of the earliest craft tools. I consider spinning to be part of my identity as a fiber artist. The physical repetitive motion of making yarn is soothing. Time consuming, but portable, I often spin throughout the day. I find the yarn or thread to be a potent symbol of the passing of time. When woven simply into the 3D printed structure, I am indicating my repeated use of digital media over a lifetime. This wearable represents my identity as a continuous thread winding in and out of the digital world. With these three hats, I seek the full picture of the way digital is involved in our personal identity. Impressions are formed and relationships are maintained as our dual identities of the physical and virtual realms meet. By titling these pieces with simple, everyday conversational phrases, I am indicating the superficiality of both our digital and physical identity, and reflecting the commonplace attitude most people take towards social media. In viewing these pieces, I hope people will reflect on their own virtual self. The future of fashion and accessories is heading towards devices which bring aware social media to the physical. A study on the balance of craft and digital mediums, I see these pieces as a new realm for this type of wearable, digitally produced and handmade. <coughs> Thank you.
here, and I'm going to talk about the 3D printing perspective and uh, all about like how uh, you can print it, the technology, and like uh, the technical aspect of it. And um, today we will learn a little bit more about the history of it, where it came from, and uh, how it's going to be shaping, and where the phase is from. I'll be talking about the background for the uh, product and uh, design, and the problems and solutions that are available at the moment, and the phase for the next uh, future. At first, he came out with a, uh, through Chuck Hall in 1984 through the systems of corporations, then and now like an internal the market for the public that uh, you're just, like, more trendier and you're able to use it like uh, individualized, such as in this school is able to use it for like I do as a student lab. And it used to be for government use, now it's more commercial and you can use it for marketing and for, uh, produce anything you want, as you can see like, here with uh, different products. And, uh, also, like, uh, you can use it for, for everything. And, yeah, the software, if you have use it through computer-aided designs, and now it's just, you can use it with anything such as Google Sketch, Rhino, and just convert it, and you can print it out. You can do a pretty, uh, pretty printing design. The software. At first, uh, it used to be for manufacturing. Now it's uh, individualized. And I used to uh, basically go through, like, a normal use school of engineering and uh, able to like learn like uh, software designing and uh, through Photoshop, Illustrator, and After Effects, I was able to pick up Rhino and able to like uh, print it through my internship that I had and uh, able to like uh, make like designs and uh, I was uh, I printed this stuff right here and it's kind of like flexible and uh, it's cool shape but at the same time it's just like uh, you know like, with the, like uh, the aspects like uh, that has an error computer headers with it and uh, you use uh, uh, let's go with uh, the design and the product. With inkjet printer, the cost can be like um, it's uh, it can be like uh, from three dollars to five hundred dollars. But with three D printer, at the moment, it's the cheapest that I found is being bought with like a uh, twelve hundred. And there's another one with like uh, two hundred dollars that recently on Kickstarter they just came out with something like about the measure of the size that you can like print anything you want. However, they're not out there yet. There are several companies as well. And they really feel you can be through, uh, through with uh, nylon, plastic, and metal if it can happen to get a sort of layer. But with an uh, inkjet printer, you can have any colors you want, anything you want, and it would be just on paper with two D dimension. The size of it is just a uh, just a regular printer that came out in the, all all the way back in 1811. It used to be big, and three D printing is uh, as big as as you can see. It could be as big as a refrigerator, or it could be as small as this shoe right here. But we are not there yet to make it more individualized for the product for ourselves. The time will take a little bit more than you would expect, but it's still going to be fast for you, but the gears and everything, it needs to go back and forth in order to print the product for you. Therefore, you need to put some oil in it just like a machine such as cars. If, the, you, have, like, if you use it a lot, then you have to like, uh, take care of it and uh, for the maintenance and be able to like, uh, produce it. How can you do it? Just like an inkjet printer, when you're printing your uh, uh, papers, anything, you just need uh, to have an application software on your computer for Microsoft or uh, PowerPoint, and therefore you are able to like, uh, print it for yourself. But with 3D printing, you can use it through Maya or through Rhino or uh, Google Sketch, and then you could uh, convert it into like, a program and just uh, print it through your 3D printing. Also, the knowledge you need to know is for software designing and you can learn um, both the basic stuff, just like Photoshop and Illustrator, and you can take it over and be able to print it. And here's a picture of a 3D printing, and on the edges is a little bit of a, it's kind of like a, you have to take over the maintenance, just like a regular car you just buy, and then you drove around in high school, and it will have wear and tears with the gears, but you have to be very, very careful with it, because if you don't, do not be uh, careful with it, to like uh, break it and it will be hard to replace it. It's, it's an expensive product. But at the same time, there's a, a flat surface, as you can see, under that blue uh, product right there. You have to take it off. You have to be very, very gentle with it. Under, under that, if you're not gentle, you might rip it off. And that's another part that you have to be careful with the surface of the plate. And the edges, this uh, spray from here, is one of the problems that it has. And it can be helpful for you that uh, once you're like trying to take it off, you can scrape it off and be able to like, get a genuine product that's clean and neat as possible. 
here's a solution that I'll make racer, make plastic, and have, and you can like just like uh, scrape it off the plate and be perfect for you to use it. And the following thing is, it's like just like any uh, other technology, gadget, technology gadgets, similar to phones, similar to uh, computers and cars. This this uh, printer is about to get smaller and more individualized for us, and the knowledge of it is uh, more useful, and we have to like uh, able to like, go about it and learn it because so later we're going to be able to use it just like all our phones, uh, just for ourselves and print anything we want, just like we call, and be able to have a class. Thank you. It's really wonderful. Thank you so much. You're right on the edge doing all these things. I have a question about the 3D printer. I read a review in the New York Times of someone who was printing food, and I'd like you to comment on that. He said it was much more laborious than it was just to open a package of spaghetti. But I wonder if you can talk about other applications besides plastics and to talk about food, whether that's a possibility. Uh, do we need the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> ideal. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, to, have, to be able to like digest food, I don't know how far can you go with uh, digesting the plastic nylon and uh, metal. And it's uh, sure it's possible to have food with uh, 3D printing, but at the same time. Powerful flavor digestive system. And I have no uh, question about having it as a food, but uh, anybody wants to try it, that would be nice. <laughs> can you talk about the objects that you have there? Can you hold them up so we can see them? Uh, this one bracelet that uh, is kind of like a flexible, you can just like, wear it and if you want. And uh, it's been like a wonder through uh, make plastic, good solution. It has become like, more flexible and you're able to like, uh, use it like. Just like to wear it and uh, go in the street with it. This one is a pie slide from the mathematical world. And this is a rubber duck that you can use like, in the bathtub. It's like a cookie cutter. This shoe is uh, kind of like a prototyping phase that uh, they gave it to me. And it was like a prototype, just like a prototype, and uh, based on the ratio, it could be just a model for uh, using it like, uh, in the stores. But at the same time, it's not. They're thinking about like uh, using it for like uh, people to like print shoes, but we don't know how far it's going to go for them. Hi, thank you very much for both of these. They were truly wonderful. And I have a question for the first presenter. Yesterday, I was speaking with graduate students in my graduate class of creativity. Have artisanry or craft students. And among them there's a little bit of hesitancy, some resistance to the computer and what it might do to worry craft making. There's a bit of fear, a bit of worry that the computer will replace the and will also replace the possibility, job possibilities for artisans in the future. Could you just comment on that please? Well, currently there are there's still things that are only accomplishable by handwork. Also, 3D printing is a long process, and it's not, it's very expensive, and printing everything does not make sense, and some things definitely still have to be handmade, just cost-wise. <laughs> No, I don't think so. I, I, I see it as supplementing design. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, this is Vicki Eager. Um, I know I've done some research and I have seen where um, at least one artist slash engineer has been um, She's been fabricating um, prosthetics 
in London, and she's been combining both prosthetics and art. Can either of you comment on where that might be going? The prosthetics are amazing. They're, they're one of my favorite things to look at right now in terms of the, the digital design world. I think that they are incredibly important, especially as our soldiers are coming home, to have something that can become part of your identity as a person and like a, an aesthetic statement to who you are that can be individualized and also help you walk is just phenomenal. I find it very exciting. Anyone else? Uh, thank you for those two wonderful presentations. I have a question for Kelsey. I really love this union of social media and fashion uh, because on the, on the surface, of course, it seems like a rather odd combination, but it makes perfect sense because fashion is a social media. In this sense, maybe the first social media. Uh, but I think it's a kind of clash at the same time because they both articulate different conceptions of privacy. Um, fashion is something that we kind of voluntarily participate and maybe we have a certain degree of agency in participating in, in, in questions of fashion, or their social media sphere, one can debate whether that's voluntary and, and how much control we have over our visibility and, and, and so on. So I wonder if that clash between different forms of publicness and the issue of privacy is also kind of part of what your, your work is about. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of further con connotations of my work in terms of People might not have a social media outlet or might not relate to it in that way. I also think that clothes aren't necessarily voluntary. I feel like we all have to wear clothes as well. Um, so in this way, I think that they're both just an aspect of our identity that has become necessary and that we don't even think about in the modern age. Yeah. 